Howdy 2020 Motors. As promised, this will be a short tour of what to expect for Project 4. This project was released a few days ago, and we're going to survey the two problems that you'll be up against in it. Uh, the two problems roughly divide into two complementary categories. In the first problem, you're given some benchmark code and are tasked with optimizing a particular function that performs a matrix operation in it. In the second problem, you are given some code and asked to write a benchmark to evaluate the speeds comparatively uh, between some of the uh, functions in it. So you'll see, to some extent, some code transfer uh, between them. And importantly, you'll probably want to examine, uh, for instance, the first benchmark code to determine uh, the, some of the timing functions and demonstrations of your use and a repetition pattern uh, that will be useful as you construct a benchmark for the second problem. So on the uh, subject of the first problem, uh, the nature of it is to optimize a certain operation on matrices. We spent some time in our discussion of the me memory system uh, talking about how a two-dimensional entity like a matrix in a, a computer program has to lay out and be embedded in a one-dimensional area that is memory, where each of the cells that comprise the matrix uh, more or less have to have a unique sort of one index address associated with it. And so provided with the uh, diagonal summing problem is some um, matrix framework that you've been looking at in labs and in homework. And so you'll want to acquaint yourself with the structure of uh, how that matrix lays out in one dimensions. Uh, generally, the problem comes uh, under solving uh, this summing of diagonals. A diagonal in a matrix, as it's 2D like this, is just to go uh, and step uh, one forwards in terms of the row and column at each point. So the main diagonal is typically starting at 0, 0 and going 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. It's probably the most important diagonal that you'd find in numerical computing, uh, but there are some instances in which you'd need to sum all potential diagonals in it. There are various numbering systems, and the most common uh, used to describe diagonals actually puts uh, things below the main diagonal at negative indices and things above them at positive indices. This makes it a little bit cumbersome in order to sum them into some other data structure, like a uh, zero indexed array, which can't have negative indices. And so we'll adopt a slightly different tack, uh, that the first diagonal uh, that's indexed to zero here is just this single element in the lower left corner of the matrix. And as you work up from that, you go uh, diagonal one, diagonal two, diagonal three, diagonal four. And you'll note this is a five by five matrix uh, with rows and columns numbered from zero to four. And so in any size uh, matrix of this kind, you'd have a main diagonal that's at the index equal to number of rows or columns minus one. Uh, summing then down, you get sums of 20, uh, 36, and you can see down here, diagonal 1 is 36. Uh, adding up uh, these three numbers that are in this green sort of diagonal number 2 gives a total of 48, and so on, as demonstrated in this uh, diagram. The upper diagonals then uh, sort of continue on in this pattern and increase the column number at which it starts, uh, and the starting element in each of those cases is uh, row 0, versus uh, the lower diagonals over here, the starting row decreases increases as you go up in index, and the starting column is always zero. There's a code that's referred to as some diag base uh, for this that's provided, and a couple variants of it we'll, we'll explore in code in just a second. Uh, but the pattern that's laid out in this code basically follows the visual pattern that you would use, where uh, in the first set of loops up here, I am going to sum down the lower diagonals. Uh, so sum first this pink, and then the salmon, and then the green, and then the scion elements. And the second set of loops uh, sums across the upper diagonal. Uh, so the orange stuff, that's the main diagonal that gets taken care of in the lower diagonal. And then we move up here and do uh, diagonals 5. Uh, that sums up to 40. That's the 1, 7, 13, 19, etc. And then the gray diagonal, uh, the tan diagonal, and the last element up here, uh, diagonal 8, which is a single element. This pattern, it should be obvious from our discussion of uh, memory, uh, does not hit the layout of how this matrix would uh, find itself in memory uh, very efficiently with respect to cache. And so it'll be your job uh, to take this code and make rearrangements of it, potentially drastically changing the algorithm that's used to compute uh, the, the, uh, some of the diagonals uh, in order to favor better cache access patterns. 
To evaluate your progress on that, uh, there is a benchmark code that is provided. And uh, this thing is called uh, SumDiag Benchmark. Uh, as you would type make uh, to build it uh, then, uh, and then run it, it'll run and sum the diagonals on various sizes of matrices. And uh, if you do so on a sort of random computer, such as your home computer, uh, then you'll get some warnings about the expected evaluation machine is actually Atlas. But you can still uh, develop code at home uh, and then ultimately deploy it on Atlas to see uh, how you're doing there. Uh, when you run this, it'll pick various sizes of matrices, not all of which are nice powers of two here. So the code you write will have to be robust for any size square matrix. And score points for you based on how much you speed up uh, your optimized version over here uh, versus the base version. Uh, in this case, uh, the optimized version went almost three times as fast, but not quite three times as fast as the base version, uh, and therefore scored two points. The total of the points then along here uh, gives you a total point score, uh, which is going to be an important part of uh, the, your total earnings in terms of credit for this problem. Running on Atlas itself, uh, which you can to get to by uh, logging in uh, due to other instructions here, uh, then you won't get any warnings. And this uh, is a score then that you can trust to some extent uh, that as you submit code, uh, the evaluators and graders will run your code on Atlas and credit you with probably the best of three runs along here. There's a cap, and it's actually not too hard to exceed the cap here uh, to consistently get, for instance, 43 raw points, and the max you can score on this is 35. Although I will mention that if you drastically exceed uh, this 35, there is some hidden bonus credit available to you, but you'll have to work a little bit harder in order to get the, that stuff. Uh, generally, then, it's uh, relatively easy to get full credit on this part. Just keep in mind that you'll also need to describe the optimizations uh, that you uh, perform and uh, work and why and how they relate to architecture uh, that uh, would increase the speed here. Uh, there's some discussion here of likely candidates and also discussion of a little uh, SumDiag uh, demonstration program uh, where this prints out stuff. As you're uh, attempting to optimize, it's very frequent that you start producing incorrect results. The benchmark will complain a lot and give you zero points if you produce incorrect results. In terms of diagnosing and debugging that, uh, printing out for small matrices what your sums are is useful. And this little sum diag print, which allows you to specify how big of a matrix uh, do you want to print, this is useful. The matrices that are used both in the benchmark uh, and in this little print uh, utility uh, are just numbered as the first row is zero to four, and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so forth. If you increase the size here, then you just get more sequential elements. This will show you then uh, what the baseline code that's provided uh, produces, which is considered the correct results, and your optimized code should continue to match that. In this case, I have some buggy version of this optim version where uh, the lower diagonal looks okay, but when I get to the main diagonal, something starts going wrong and I get incorrect results. So I'd want to fix that up because I'll get zero points on the benchmark otherwise. So they use these tools uh, to affect and study the optimizations that we are examining in lectures in order to get some ideas uh, for what to do. There's some additional hints down here, including a handy formula that would allow you to determine for a given element uh, of a matrix, a column and a sort of row index, uh, what is the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the diagonal number associated with it. And I'm seeing here, this is actually a bug. This is, is ordered incorrectly that it should be a row number, column number, as you're calling mget. Uh, make a correction to that here. Uh, most of the credit associated with this problem then is going to come from the performance evaluation. Uh, there's also a brief sort of testing thing that you can access uh, just to ensure that you don't have any memory errors. Uh, access that the uh, uh, make uh, prob1 valgrind, and that will run the test there. As you submit to Gradescope, when that link opens up, uh, this will be there. But uh, the bulk of the credit comes from uh, you just, uh, first getting good um, sort of uh, uh, performance and speed ups there, and also writing fairly clean and well documented code in there. Uh, you'll have to describe some of this in your write up here. Uh, and I may as well jump down to the last section of the spec. Provided with the project is a little P4 write up. Uh, and then the first problem, you have some things to describe, including pasting in your source code. That's easy points if ever there was. And providing a table of the timing that's provided on Atlas just for our reference. We will trust but verify on this front as they actually run your code. Uh, the bulk of the points for problem one just come then from describing the optimizations that you performed in order to get better performance and relating those uh, to why you get speed up by using those optimizations. 
Uh, one last uh, sort of mention uh, here on that front uh, that there's some tricks built into the source code associated with this problem. If you look carefully at the provided template for this sumdiag uh, optim.c, and this is the student version because I don't want to reveal the optimizations I used for this, you'll notice it has this structure where there's some uh, code up here that you can write in this version one, some code you can write in version two, and sumdiag optim itself just calls one of these functions. This will allow you to experiment with several different versions to see what gets you the best speed up uh, just by then modifying which one of the uh, functions up here is called uh, version one, version two, etc. Uh, you can rename these if you like. You can add additional ones up there. Uh, and as a demonstration of that, uh, if you look in the base uh, code up here, you'll see there's this normal version up here that shows up in the spec. There's also a debug version that prints out a bunch of stuff, uh, which is handy for me as I was debugging, but probably won't serve any purpose for you. Uh, and then down here, uh, the sumdiag base uh, function itself just passes through and calls uh, one of those earlier versions. Use that strategy so that if you have something in your optimized version that runs reasonably fast, uh, you don't discard it, uh, that you instead copy it and then make some tweaks to it to see if uh, versions, uh, you can eke out a little bit more performance or if it's the same there. And when you finalize, just leave whatever function you wrote uh, performs best uh, in here in the hook associated with that uh, optimized version uh, down here. Uh, so feel free to expand on this uh, just a little bit. Uh, just know that uh, whatever function gets called down here, that's the one that we're going to evaluate your code on uh, when it comes grading time. The second problem uh, has to do with uh, benchmarking uh, some of the classic search algorithms that you will have studied in any data structures course. Uh, these uh, boil down to a linear search in data structures like arrays and linked lists, or the uh, sort of canonical binary search uh, that is possible in both a sorted array and also in data structures that are specifically oriented, uh, oriented towards it, uh, specifically uh, binary search trees in this case. Uh, in this case, we'll be evaluating whether or not those big O logarithmic and linear complexities associated with these search algorithms actually play out in practice. Uh, you are provided these codes, and to demonstrate that, in the code pack itself uh, is a file called uh, searchfunks.c. Uh, and in here are the linear array search, the linked list search, uh, binary array search, and binary tree search, along with various other utilities, for instance, to create an array of various things, create uh, a list of even elements, uh, create a trees of even elements, and to uh, get rid of those things. So all of this is provided to you, and it'll instead be your job to create some sort of a benchmark that fairly compares these on various sizes of things. What you should look for in terms of creation there is uh, you'll be searching in all the data structures. Uh, they'll comprise entirely even elements. So in an array with 10 things in it, uh, what you should uh, place into that array is 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., uh, up to uh, whatever the maximum size is. And similarly, if you're searching linked lists, uh, then the first node of that will contain uh, the integer 0. The second node, its data, will contain the integer 2. Uh, the third node, uh, 4, and so on. Uh, same thing for trees, although arranged somewhat differently there. This makes it easy then to search those data structures uh, for the following sequence of numbers, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Some of these will be successful and others of them will be unsuccessful. As in, I can find 0 in an array of evens, uh, but I can't find 1. I can find 2 in a linked list that contains even numbers, uh, but I can't find 3. This is to create uh, a fair comparison in which uh, it is more costly to locate uh, some kinds of elements in these data structures than others. Uh, for instance, it should be apparent that a linear search in a linked list, uh, it will terminate when it finds something, but potentially search the entire list uh, when the thing that's being looked for is not present there. Uh, this is a difference then that you'd see in some of the other data structures and algorithms where it can more quickly locate things uh, or not search the entire uh, sort of data structure uh, to determine that the thing I'm looking for isn't present in there. 
So in your innermost loops here, you'll be repeatedly calling one of these search functions to search a tree for a particular number uh, or search a linked list for a particular number. Uh, outside of that, you should repeat this as in uh, to scale up the timing associated with uh, these searches. Uh, for instance, searching a small array of 32 elements takes almost no time, uh, irrespective of whether you're searching for something that's present or not. And so you'd want to repeat that search a bunch of times uh, in order to scale the time up to be trustworthy. If you're timing things that are coming out as it only took uh, 10 to the minus five, uh, fifth uh, seconds, uh, that's going to be fairly shaky. And so you should trust times that are only in the uh, tenths to hundredths of seconds. Uh, by repeating a search a whole bunch of times, uh, then you would uh, get some scaling up of that time and start to trust those numbers more. Finally, then, uh, you'll probably have an outermost loop that iterates over different sizes of these structures. In total, then, uh, what you can look for is a reporting that looks sort of like this, that for a size 32 data structure, uh, I will, uh, and this is the first five here, uh, it indicates the power of two size for the data structure. So an array of size uh, two to the fifth, that's 32, or a linked list of the size uh, two to the fifth, that's 32 nodes. Uh, I'm gonna repeat uh, the search 10 times. Uh, and what I'm searching for uh, in this is elements zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, up to uh, sort of uh, size 32. So it'll be up to uh, uh, 63 in this case. So that's where the 640 is coming for is that I'm gonna do twice this uh, uh, number of searches. And I'm gonna repeat that 10 times. So that's 64 by 10, 640 total searches. Uh, and the last argument to your benchmark then is which search algorithms to run. In this case, uh, linear search in an array and linear search search in a linked list. Uh, I don't care terribly uh, if you honor the ordering of that. And for convenience sake, I would encourage you all to essentially treat this argument as a string, search for the letter A in it, which will turn on searching in linearly in arrays, and search for this the character L in it, which will turn on searching in linked lists. There's no B to search for uh, binary searches in arrays, and no T to search for trees, we'll see. Uh, but I don't care terribly if uh, you specify A, L, and do an array and list search. If you specify L, A to turn on linked list searching and array searching, uh, you can still do the array search first uh, and then the linked list search. The point is to compare these two and so the ordering doesn't matter too much. Uh, so to that end, this can make uh, the parsing uh, arrangement of looking at this last argument of which uh, algorithms to run uh, somewhat easier on that front. Uh, by default, uh, the searches should do all of the uh, specified. Uh, so in this case, a specification of uh, start at uh, data structures size two to the ninth, go up to size two to the 14th, uh, do one repetition of each of them. Uh, and uh, the last argument being missing, uh, run all of array, linear search, linked list, linear search, binary search in an array and binary search in a BST. Uh, to that end, uh, you can uh, sort of do one repetition and uh, launch all of these. However, I specified only the array, the linked list and the binary search, uh, then limit that to three in any order uh, that makes it easy uh, to compare. What you'll find is that this is necessary because as you go up in size, some of these algorithms start taking an inordinate amount of time, uh, for instance, tens of seconds, uh, versus others scream along at fractions of a second. And so it makes sense to only compare uh, the fastest algorithms at much larger sizes. After constructing this algorithm and uh, sort of this benchmark and uh, doing a little bit of evaluation to make sure that you feel the results are correct, uh, then you'll have a series of questions to answer uh, that pertain to comparisons between those things. Uh, most of the credit then for this is to uh, describe uh, what you observe after constructing this benchmark. And for that, we'll turn our attention down to this write-up uh, down here. Uh, the P4 write-up includes a bunch of questions in problem two that uh, query whether or not you can see some minimum size at which you start to see some algorithms diverge in performance from others. Uh, to compare uh, the linear search and the, the linked list search arrays, uh, uh, or sorry, linked list uh, searches in those two data structures, uh, to compare uh, the tree and the binary searches and arrays, and particularly to focus on the memory system and its effects on these. Uh, you'll notice some differences for some of these and a lack of differences for some of them. And so we'll wanna relate that back, particularly to the caching effects that we've discussed in terms of the memory system. There's one final note here that there's a bit of bonus credit available on this um, uh, problem. 
the one thing that you'll notice as you write a benchmark is uh, your uh, linked list uh, or your uh, search benchmark is that you'll do a lot of sort of repeated coding here. And so the general structure you'll probably see is uh, for zero up to whatever the main size is. Uh, if you're going to do the linear array search, uh, then you'll set up the array, you'll start some timer, you do a bunch of searches within it, stop the timer, you'll free the array, uh, print the output, etc. And that basic pattern, if uh, for the same size thing, uh, allocate a linked list, uh, start a timer, do the searches, stop the timer, print the output, free the list. That's basically a repeat with the modulation that here I'm doing it with a list instead of uh, an array. As you move down and do the binary search uh, within the array, you'll see a similar pattern and the search tree as well, a similar pattern of this. Uh, it should prickle your coding sense just a little bit that like there's probably a better way to do this kind of thing where the only thing that's changing between these is what I'm initializing, the search uh, that I'm doing, and how I'm freeing the data structure here. Uh, to that end, you can earn some bonus credit by exploring uh, an extra concept in C, which is to construct object-like things that describe, for this case, how do I set up, search, and free this data structure uh, that allow you to just iterate over some array of sort of functions uh, that you would call, uh, uh, indicating whether or not I'm doing the linear array, then call certain functions uh, to allocate, search, and free stuff there. I won't say a ton more on this uh, front, but I will try at some point try to provide a few more resources on it. There's some hints here that you can set up some sort of a little data structure that comprises all of the, quote, algorithms, end quote, associated with uh, the searching, uh, and that you can have some descriptions here, and in this struct of some kind that you must devise, uh, have uh, literal references to the functions that you would call to do a linear search, uh, to create a data structure that is an evens array, uh, and how you would clean up that array, in this case, simply by freeing. Uh, there's a mention down here then of the linked list search where I have some casting here to make these things look similar uh, to each other. And you can see then logically this could be extended to include uh, the binary array search and the tree search there. Uh, what exactly uh, the meaning of this thing is and how would you get uh, a, a sort of structure array that contains function pointers is, uh, is the challenging part of this. It doesn't have as much to do uh, with actually getting numbers in terms of searches, but more to do with uh, elegantly engineering a sort of software solution to this that has as few repeated bits of code as possible. Uh, to that end, I'll try to put up a little resource uh, that talks a little bit about casting and function pointers in C, uh, but if you want to get a head start on this portion to earn uh, the five or so points of bonus credit associated with this, uh, then you'd want to do a little bit of research on your own at this point. That is your quick tour of what's involved in uh, Project 4. Uh, well, I should mention one more uh, thing uh, that I have not revealed any of my times here uh, in terms of the uh, sort of expected results over here. So that leaves it to you to determine what you think is sensible for a lot of these. Uh, I'll warn one more time, the expected uh, sort of evaluation is going to be to run the search benchmark on Atlas again. So same as for the uh, uh, multi or the sum diagonal uh, benchmark. And also I was is un sort of real to trust times that are less than uh, sort of one or 0 0.01 or zero, let's say 10 to the minus tooth seconds. So you want to uh, use a, some number of repetitions that gets even your smallest sizes up here uh, up to about a one hundredth of a second before you could start trusting results. As you have questions, stop by office hours uh, or ping me during our lecture discussions to ask uh, follow up questions on the project. Uh, Piazza is always open for business on that front, uh, and I wish you all well in terms of coding this thing up. Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult. Just make sure to leave enough time towards the end to actually think hard about what the benchmark results are here for, uh, for this search benchmark. A lot of students sort of uh, spend a lot of time trying to get the code right at the last minute, but then uh, leave off on the evaluation. And if you look at the credit allocation here, uh, then uh, there's actually quite a bit of credit associated with uh, doing the write-up for this, uh, this problem. Uh, and I guess I misspoke earlier, there's up to 10 uh, sort of uh, makeup credit points associated with that optional part of this. All right, uh, I will see you guys in lecture, I hope, and happy hacking until then.